We are here this evening with Julie Dornback, who is the daughter of William Newby, who is one of the models who was in the original Quintanilla murals back 1940, 1941. She's here today to share her story of her father and his involvement with the murals. Julie, thank you for coming. It's great to be here, I'm thrilled. Uh, what did your father tell you about growing up in Kansas City during the Depression? Growing up in Kansas City during the Depression, both of my parents grew up here. Mm -hmm. And the thing that they had in common was that both of their mothers passed away when they were young. My father's mother passed away from tuberculosis and left four children and a widower. So it was hard. They had uh, some not so nice housekeepers. They talked about um, how they slept in a room that was open air. They called it a sleeping porch and they slept there year round. And so it was very, very cold in the winter. So it's kind of harsh, you know. Um, their father was a secretary for a hardware company, and fortunately, he did not lose his job. Um, and then, as you know, they all four came here to University of Kansas City, which then later became UMKC. Yeah. So did they all go to Paseo High School? I believe so. Right. I believe so. Okay. Uh -huh. And why did they choose to come to University of Kansas City because it was the hometown close to I think because it was the because it was a practical decision. It was a very practical family. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, your father majored in chemistry? He did. Uh, did he always have an interest in science? I think he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did a lot. Of, they had a nice basement workshop in their house mm -hmm. and he talked about how he and his brothers, it was three boys and a girl mm -hmm. and they would do a lot of tinkering in the workshop and they were all very mechanically inclined. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. um, so in 1940, he was asked by Louise Quintanilla to uh, be a model for these murals. Mm -hmm. uh, did he tell you anything about that experience? He did. He said he was just walking across campus, minding his own business, and he was approached. He didn't know anything about the mural project, but he was a very enthusiastic guy. He was thrilled and he jumped right in. Mm -hmm. And did he, uh, did he, uh, you know, consider this to be like a point of pride, you know, in Absolutely. his life. You know, it's funny, though, because my brother, who's much older, doesn't remember him telling the story at all. He doesn't remember this at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it was when he got older, he started telling stories of his youth more. Mm -hmm. But my mother was also familiar with the story, but she wasn't here yet because she's four years younger. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after Pearl Harbor, your, uh, your father and his siblings all joined the service? They sure did. They joined right up. Yeah, that was a point of family pride. What, uh, what was his military service like? What did, what did he do? He was a life? medic in the U.S. Army, mm -hmm. and he uh, was in the 12th Armored Division, um, and he drove a Jeep. Mm -hmm. And he was a little guy, kind of, you know, with a kind of a whimsical look to him, mm -hmm. and everybody called him Jeep. That was his nickname. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he was over there in the Battle of the Bulge in Europe. Um, he, you know, right on the front lines. If you watch MASH, um, they get those buses that come into the MASH unit. Mm -hmm. He was on the front lines, 19 years old, loading people into those buses. Really traumatic. Mm -hmm. And yet the most traumatic thing that he experienced was when they came across a chain gang of Holocaust prisoners who it was right before the end of the war and the Nazis had just let all these people go um, in chain gangs. And he said that they were, so he had enough medical training to know that they were all gonna die. And he, they, the 12th Armored Division gave them all of their supplies and all of their food and then had to let, keep letting them go. Wow. So that was pretty intense for him. Yeah. When he got out of the service, he returned back to the university to finish his degree? He came right back to the university. And he was four years older. Mm -hmm. And you know, all of a sudden, you know, they were keeping the fires warm on the home front. And then all the GIs came home and everything changed. And um, my mom was studying. As I said, she's four years younger. She also grew up in Kansas City. And she was studying chemistry mm -hmm. here. And they had a lab together. And... She was messing with her burette tube, which has a glass stopcock at the bottom, and you're supposed to have your science experiment in the tube, right? 
And she made a mistake and the whole thing spilled out on the floor. And dad is across the room. He's never met her. He's kind of a shy guy, but he saw his in, right? So he went diving across the room, got a clean shop towel, soaked the whole thing up, wrung it out into the burette tube again, and she ended up passing the lab. <laughs> then he asked her out on a date, and he was a short guy, and so she went out and bought one pair of flats to go on the date. She came home from the date, threw away all of her high heels, and got all the rest flats, because <laughs> she knew she was going to stay with this stay guy. With them. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Did your parents tell you anything about like the student life of the time at the university? Like any of the traditions, like the campus pond or Hobo Day or anything like I, that? I remember hearing about Hobo Day. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, tell me about Hobo Day. So it was, it started in 1935. Uh -huh. Students, uh, on a whim, came to campus dressed as hobos. Uh -huh. And they put on skits at the afternoon, lampooning the school's administration. Well, this became a yearly tradition. Uh -huh. And it became a student holiday. Classes would be canceled the last Friday of April. And they would come all dressed in hobos. And they would have you know different song and skit contests. And the tradition was to lampoon the, the professors and the administration. They'd have like pie eating contests. and you know, beard growing contest, and they had a tug of war over the campus pond. Um, yes. That kind of thing. So I'm sure, I remember my dad talking about Hobo Day, and it sounded familiar to me when you mentioned mm -hmm. that. And he's totally the guy that would have been involved with this, mm -hmm. because his thing, and I don't know if it was somewhat inspired by Quintanilla, mm -hmm. but he liked to draw caricatures of people. Mm -hmm. And he also liked to make up little songs. And there was one song, because they were studying chemistry, um, I don't know what that song is from the 40s, but they were studying butadiene, and it was, oh, you butadiene, you great big butadiene, but it was a takeoff from some love song from uh, back then. So I think that was part of the Hobo Days thing, too. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's hard to imagine, you know, that back in that time, then, like, you know, the most popular college music was big band jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like Frank Sinatra, but you know, the, for today's students, that's impossible for them to imagine. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so after uh, he graduated, what what, it did, what happened to him? What, what did he go on to do? Well, he went to Northwestern mm -hmm. and he got a PhD in organic chemistry, mm -hmm. which blows my mind. You know, most of us can't even understand organic chemistry. Yeah. He was a very smart guy. Um, and his brothers both went on to be metallurgists mm -hmm and they worked for Armco Steel. Dad went to, uh, took a job with the DuPont Company because he was a chemist and moved to Wilmington, Delaware and he raised us and lived the rest of his life in Wilmington, Delaware. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you'd sent me some photos of him where he uh, had an interest in art later on in life. Where, he so, did. where did that come from? Was it inspired well, by his experience? Or? Maybe so because I don't think he was really exposed to painting you know, as a child. And then he had this experience, you know, and over the course of his adulthood, he started taking classes and he got pretty good. He uh, did a lot of sculpture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, did he come back to Kansas City and visit family here sure. throughout the years? Sure. Would he come back and visit? So the his whole family was from Platte County, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And mom's whole family was from Highland, Kansas. Okay. And so... They had both grown up in Kansas City, but that's where all the extended relatives were. So, oh well, yeah, we would come back. Yeah. yeah. So this is not the first time you visited the murals. You've been here to Kansas City before to see them. Well, that. I visited the mural as an adult one time before, because usually when we came here, we weren't coming to Kansas City. We were either yeah. going to Highland or we were going to Black County. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do you think now, seeing, seeing this... Uh, Portrait of your dad frozen as a young man here on the wall as part of oh, the university's history. I totally history. love it. I mean, it's, it's very whimsical and, you know, it's, it captures his personality. Yeah. It's funny that he has a deadpan look on his face because he was always smiling. Yeah. You know, the, I, I imagine Quintanilla was like, stop smiling. You know, I don't want to smile. Yeah. <laughs> It was funny because when we were trying to discover who the students were that were the original models, we were going through your books, looking at pictures. And of course, you know, we saw his picture like, that's him. I mean, there yep. was just no doubt about yep. it. You didn't have to, you know, look at more photos. You just knew automatically that was yep. him because Quintanilla really captured 
really captured his essence. Yeah, so. the eyebrows. You know, he yeah. had incredible eyebrows. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming and uh, visiting with us and sharing your, uh, your history, your father. Thank you for uh, making his history part of the university's history. Well, thank you. And I think it's terrific, this project you all are doing to not only restore the physical murals, but to do all this deep dive into the history behind yeah. them. And our eventual goal is to cre help create interpretation for students and guests so mm -hmm. they can walk into this space and know everything we've told you today. Mm -hmm. um, and so really have an understanding of what these murals mean and, and how they're an important part of the university's history, but also an important part of, of art history. Right. Um, and they've, it's been a hidden treasure here for 82 years and we mm -hmm. wanna share it with the world now. So Terrific. thank you for helping us do that. Thank you. Uh,